Thank you everyone who's tuning in this morning. I'm super excited to be here with you to talk about all things Western monarchs and community science and really dive into the ways that we've been utilizing community science to support and protect monarchs and their habitat in the Western United States. So I am guessing that some of you who are tuning in are either interested in community science or perhaps you already volunteer for some of our programs. So big shout out and thank you to you guys and all of your effort and interest as well. Um, so again, my name is Isis Howard. I've been with the Xerces Society for a little over two years and I manage and run our Western Monarch Community Science programs, including the Western Monarch Thanksgiving Count and the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper. I want to start by um, acknowledging the incredible work that our organization does. For those of you who are not familiar with the Xerces Society, we are named after the Xerces blue butterfly, which is now extinct. It was one of the first butterflies known to go extinct due to human causes, um, development of its habitat in and around the Bay Area. We were founded more than 50 years ago and we're an um, international nonprofit that focuses on protecting wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitats. We're science-based. We work with diverse partners, including scientists, land managers, educators, policymakers, farmers, and community members like you all. Um, we use applied research. We engage in advocacy. We provide educational resources restoration and other technical um, support services. We address policy implications to make meaningful long-term conservation a reality. So if you are not familiar with the Xerces Society, please follow us on YouTube, all social medias, check out our website. We have a bunch of free resources from plant lists if you're an avid gardener to habitat kit programs if you are a land manager um, to so much more such as you know, tips and tricks on reducing pesticide use. We offer support to ag managers. So just check out our website. Um, so much of our resources are there and available to you for free. Um, so yeah, don't let it go. Oh, and I want to mention too, Rachel, who's on this webinar, just started um, Bug Banter, which is a new podcast hosted by the Xerces Society. So if you're like me and like to listen to... Um, podcasts, to learn things on your drives or commutes, please do check out Bug Banter. We're really excited about the launch of that new podcast. So we're all here because we're going to talk about Western monarchs and community science. So I want to first make sure we're all on the same page with what are Western monarchs? How do they differ from Eastern monarchs? Um, so in this slide, you can see a map of the United States and you see a bunch of red and yellow arrows there. So a lot of people, when they hear about monarchs and their epic migration, they immediately think of the Eastern monarch butterflies, which breed and migrate east of the Rocky Mountains, traveling from Canada and the United States down to overwinter in Mexico. But in this webinar, um, specifically, we're going to be talking about Western monarch butterflies. So the butterflies that breed, migrate, and overwinter west of the Rocky Mountains. Um, we actually have, if you're from California, we have over 400 butterfly overwintering sites along our coastline from Mendocino down to Baja, California. And so it's this epic phenomenon that not a lot of people recognize um, as close to home. Uh, most people are familiar with seeing monarchs early on in childhood, maybe through school. They can see them flying around in their communities. Monarchs are really this iconic butterfly. The vibrant orange and black wings make them stand out against the blue sky. Um, so I think a lot of times the first, one of the first uh, butterflies that people learn about is the monarch. And it holds so much significance culturally to many peoples across North America and beyond due to its grand migration um, that spans, you know, thousands of, up to thousands of miles. Monarchs are one of those species that impacts many of our lives, whether we live in urban, rural, or suburban areas, um, because they're passing through so many of our communities on their journeys. 
Now, monarchs are in a bit of trouble. The main threats that they're facing right now are loss and degradation of overwintering habitat, insufficient milkweed available, availability from late winter to early spring. So monarchs are one of the invertebrates that rely on a specific plant, the milkweed plants, to reproduce. So the adult butterflies will only lay eggs on milkweed plants and the caterpillars will only eat milkweed plants to grow. So there's this relationship between milkweed and monarchs that's absolutely crucial to supporting monarch butterflies. But milkweed was seen as a weed and kind of eradicated across the landscape um, several decades ago. And so we're now encouraging folks to plant a milkweed um, where it's in its native range to better support monarch butterflies and other iris pollinators, because it's also a great nectar resource. Um, another threat is shortage of nectar resources. So again, we're encouraging folks to plant native nectar resources. So native nectar plants, any blooming flower that's native to your region. We really support native plants as a conservation organization because of the um, co-evolution of our native pollinators and other species with the native plants in our areas. So just like the monarch has this connection with milkweed, we see a lot of other pollinators, whether it's butterflies, bees, moths, etc., have a special relationship with a particular kind of plant. And so that's why we do encourage you to check out the native plant section at your nurseries when you go shopping and to just double check and ask questions about whether they're pollinator friendly or bee safe plants, um, maybe grown without pesticides. So a couple other threats include climate change that's exacerbating some of these habitat loss issues. In California, we've seen a lot of trouble with drought and senescing trees that are overwintering groves. We'll get into that a bit later, but the overwintering groves that monarchs rely on each winter provide really critical protection from you know, rain and, and different storms and wind events. So to have these trees start kind of losing their canopy, some are falling over and we're not kind of um, managing the grove in a way where we're planting new trees to fill in the gaps, like that can become an issue. So um, with the droughts and the recent storms and severe weather events, we're seeing our landscapes change, our tree grows change, and that's having impacts on our butterflies. Tie it in with community science, um, we are going to dive into this a bit later, but because of over 300 plus volunteers who actively participate in the Western Monarch Thanksgiving count, which happens every year at overwintering sites, um, we now know that monarch butterflies have declined more than 95% since the 1980s. So we're seeing a really incredible decline in Western monarch butterfly populations, despite an increasing number of volunteers and partners who are helping us do this work to trap monarch butterflies and their habitat each year. Um, so I mentioned before that monarchs are a very migratory species. They're traveling hundreds to thousands of miles. So how do we get a population status estimate? Like how do we track that population if they're spread across North America? Um, how do we do that? Well, going back to the overwintering sites, every winter they're either, the Eastern monarchs are going down to Mexico to overwinter in the OML fir forests, and the Western monarchs are clustering along those protected overwintering groves along our California coast down to Northern Baja, California. And so this is the one moment each year where monarchs are clustering or aggregating in these specific spots. They return to the same groves every year, typically. So we send people out, everyday people, like, you know, it can be professionals like myself, or other scientists, but it can also be, you know, a middle school teacher or a lawyer or, you know, a carpenter. It could be anybody who has interest in participating in um, these community science efforts to gather research. And then we'll, we'll train them up, send them out to these overwintering sites, and they'll bring binoculars and a little data sheet and we'll have them actually zoom in with their binoculars on these clustering butterflies come up with a count estimate for that grove, 
and then we'll tally all that together for all of the 400 plus sites across California and get the estimate for the Western Monarch population. And we have standardized protocol and training for all of our volunteers. So we're able to compare these counts um, between years and across years. So the Western Monarch Thanksgiving count started in 1997 by Mia Monroe and a few other really wonderful monarch um, conservationists. And now it's grown from a handful of people to again, over 300 volunteers participating, plus numerous agencies, local organizations. The Xerces Society now takes a big role in coordinating that project. Um, and you can see here by this blue and green graph that we're tracking the monarch count estimates from 1997 all the way up to 2022. And this year's Thanksgiving count is currently underway. So it's a little too late to participate in this count, but you are now learning about this for next year. And maybe this presentation will inspire you to get out to some of the groves, to start looking for monarchs around in your communities. And I'm also gonna give you some more opportunities to participate in, in spring, summer, fall. Um, so just stay tuned for those. Here is um, a graph of the more than 90% decline since the 1980s. Um, so it just, we see an uptick in the last couple of years with that orange, uh, the orange line there. And so back in 2020, we saw only 2,000, around 2,000 butterflies across the um, West. And that was really, really shocking because before we had been seeing, you know, monarchs numbering in, you know, a couple hundred thousand. Um, in the 80s, again, we saw low millions. There were so many that tree branches were drooping with the weight of so many monarch butterflies. And you know, for context, a monarch butterfly weighs like less than a paper clip. So <laughs> to make a tree branch droop, that, that's taking tons and tons of monarchs. Um, but again, in 2020, we saw this massive drop and our volunteers went out to their sites that they'd been visiting year after year, and they saw empty sites or only a couple hundred butterflies when normally they had 20,000. And so this caused a lot of fear and concern um, and really initiated this all hands on deck effort to help support and protect the monarch butterflies. Luckily, in the past two years, we've seen a, a slight up or uptick in the monarch count numbers. So we saw, you know, a little over 250,000, a little over 300,000. And now this year, we're seeing them again in our overwintering sites. We're not seeing them in as high of numbers as the last two years, but we are seeing greater numbers than 2020. So I'm, you know, estimating, guessing that this year we'll probably see a total Thanksgiving count tally somewhere in between, um, you know, the low lows of 2020 and the, the more recent uptick of the last two years. So <clears throat> there, and additionally, one of our partners with um, Cheryl Schultz with the Washington State University uh, led this PVA of Western monarch population. And the study suggested that Western monarch population has a 72% probability of quasi-extinction in the next 20 years. They've also estimated four to 10 million monarchs overwintering in California in the 1980s. Whereas in the past five years, we've been able to see again between the 2,000 and 300,000 monarchs. Um, so this volunteer generated data from our community science projects has been used by not only these researchers, not only the Xerces Society, but also the United States Fish and Wildlife Service to model species resiliency for the Western monarch population as part of the species status assessment process. Um, and so all of this data is really going to emphasize the importance of creating policy changes to better support monarchs so that we don't see them go extinct in the next couple decades. Um, we also have a follow-up count to the Thanksgiving count called the Western Monarch New Year's count. And so this is an effort, um, again, very heavily supported by our community science volunteers. They go out after a few of the winter storms to see how monarchs are faring during the overwintering season. So we count in November, kind of the Thanksgiving count because it's the peak, right? So the winter is just beginning. 
Um, we haven't seen too many big storms, so we see the highest number of overwintering monarchs in November, typically. And then in January, when we do the New Year's count, we typically see a seasonal decrease, just because, again, we've had rains, we have wind, um, predators, you know, might be eating some of the monarchs, and we just see this, like, interseasonal um, decrease, or interseasonal decrease. So um, again, this is community science data. We added the New Year's count in 2016 to 2017, but we're gonna continue it. And we're thinking of adding a Halloween or Dia de los Muertos count as well each year. So there's plenty of opportunities to get involved in monarch counting if you would like. Here's a couple pictures of our volunteers training to count butterflies. Again, with the binoculars, we take them out to overwintering groves teach them how to locate and find the butterflies and how to make estimates of their clusters because it's pretty tricky when they're clustering 360 around leaves and branches. Um, here's a few pictures from some of our largest overwintering sites. On the left, we have a picture of butterflies clustering at the Pacific Grove Butterfly Sanctuary out in Monterey. Um, if any of you are in California and would love to visit some of these butterfly groves, the Pacific Grove Butterfly Sanctuary in Monterey is really a lovely one. It's available to the public, has public bathrooms, trails to go view the monarchs. I was actually out there last week and there's um, big monarch clusters right over the trail. And so um, just perfect visual access to them if you want to take a photo, take some kids. Um, it's just absolutely stunning. I hope everyone adds it to their bucket list. Um, and then this picture on the right is monarchs clustering on a redwood tree at a private site in um, Santa Barbara. So some folks who live along the coast where monarchs typically overwinter are lucky enough to have a monarch overwintering site in their very own backyard. I'm very jealous of those folks, um, but they're gracious enough to let our community science volunteers head out and count the monarchs at their site. So I've kind of painted this picture of a decline over the last few decades. And you might be wondering like, where are monarchs now? Like what, you know, are there any protections right now? Um, are they endangered, threatened, vulnerable? And so the current conservation status is um, a little bit confusing because there's a few different names that have been tossed around in the past couple of years. Uh, they are currently listed as vulnerable on the IUCN Red List. The IUCN Red List is really wonderful for, um, you know, spreading the word about species that need assistance and need support, um, but there are no policy implications to the IUCN Red List. So this vulnerable status raises awareness, helps us, um, you know, get more funds for monarch conservation. They do a great assessment of the species, um, but again, it's not creating any laws or policies that help protect monarchs. Now, the Federal Endangered Species Act, on the other hand, or the ESA, that does have policy implications. And right now, the monarch butterfly is listed as a candidate species. Um, and so what that means is that it's up for listing, but they haven't made a listing decision yet. That said, it's reviewed every year, and we do expect monarchs to be listed under the ESA in fall of next year. So we're crossing our fingers, um, not because we want monarchs to be listed. Ideally, they would not be listed because they're doing so well, but also in this really critical time, it's really important that we develop these policy protections um, to help us better manage our groves and all the habitats that monarchs rely on and need to um, be successful. So again, here's a little map of overwintering sites along the coast. There's more than 400 sites in the West. More than half of these um, are publicly managed. So maybe state parks or regional parks, um, things like that. And you can visit various sites along the coast. Uh, Natural Bridges State Park is another one in Santa Cruz. Um, Pismo Beach is another one down in San Luis Obispo. We have Elwood Mesa down in Santa Barbara. Um, and then some, you know, there's <laughs> lots of sites down in SoCal too. If you're really curious, I'll just say visit westernmonarchcount.org and you can view our interactive map and find overwintering sites near you. 
Um, I kind of already went over this with the threats to overwintering sites, but basically we're really, really hoping um, to increase conservation of these overwintering sites to help protect monarchs when they're most vulnerable. Because we, well, I'm not gonna go back to the map, but remember that migra migratory map where we're seeing the monarchs travel hundreds of thousands of miles to the West Coast and to Mexico? Well, this is like one generation of butterflies. So typically, you know, monarchs might live a couple weeks long in summer when they're breeding, but the generation that migrates can live anywhere from like three to nine months. So this generation of butterflies or the super generation has to endure a giant migration down to these protected groves, survive all the threats and challenges of winter, and then migrate back out into um, its breeding zone. And so really we see overwintering sites as this critical kind of habitat where we can put a bunch of emphasis on protecting and conserving to best support monarchs at their most vulnerable point. Um, beyond overwintering sites and along the coast, we do have a map to show priority restoration zones for Western monarchs as well. So you can check out this map and learn what might be best for your area on Xerces.org. Um, and we have a bunch of conservation planning and restoration resources as well. And again, our community science volunteers who go out and count the butterflies also give us information on the status of the groves. They tell us how the trees are doing, if any branches have fallen. Um, they also, you know, note if there's nectar resources. And if there's not, then maybe they're out there planting nectar resources, like some of these folks here. Um, and so they're really helping to, to um, conserve and kind of reinvigorate the landscape with all the resources needed to support the migratory population. So if you're interested in community science, just know that one thing might lead to another and you might find yourself <laughs> um, making a bunch of new friends, getting your hands dirty. Um, but also, if that's not your thing, there are plenty of opportunities we'll go over to, um, you know, just snap a picture and submit it online. Uh, but there are opportunities for you to get more involved if that is something you're interested in. Again, here are some of our partners replanting trees to make up for some of the trees that have been lost to drought or storm damage. Um, so we're really, really grateful to Xerces Society to work with so many amazing partners and volunteers in the community. Um, you all have shown up, spread the word, um, and helped support us in ways um, that we can, you know, we're, we're just so thankful, but you've really helped us make changes you've made changes in your communities too. So this leads me to um, kind of the more community science part of this presentation where I want to share a few opportunities with you and better explain how and why you should get involved in community science. So really um, there's an all hands on deck nationwide effort to help Western monarchs and other at-risk pollinators recover um, but, it, but it starts in your community, or at least it can. So um, <clears throat> community science is one of those incredible things where it brings together folks of all different backgrounds, ability levels, uh, education levels, socioeconomic statuses, and it provides an opportunity for everyday people to get involved in wide ranging scientific research that has a very tangible impact on, on certain species. And so um, regardless of your background, you have an opportunity to participate meaningfully in data collection and scientific understanding of key issues that affect the species important to you. And so um, from monarchs to fireflies, to bumblebees, to so much more, there's something for everyone out there. Um, and again, we'll talk about kind of different time commitments and different training requirements for various projects if you're not yet involved. Um, but I can promise you that if you are interested, there will be something for you. Um, and you don't need to invest a whole lot of time or money into supplies if you don't want to. So, um, we'll start with the Western Monarch Count, which again is comprised of the Thanksgiving Count and the New Year's Count. 
We're surveying monarch butterflies at their overwintering science, uh, sorry, at their overwintering sites. It's coordinated by Xerces Society, myself, and our co-founder, Mia Monroe, as well as our key volunteers based in each county who help lead on the ground efforts and trainings for local volunteers. We call those our regional coordinators. They're really, really fabulous people with years of experience um, managing our volunteers and, and leading uh, trainings in the field. And we have over 300 active volunteers. I think this year we may have reached 400 volunteers for the Thanksgiving count off the double check, but it's absolutely amazing. Again, this started as just like three or four people went to like seven, 12, and it just slowly grew over the last couple of decades. Um, so you can visit westernmonarchcount.org to learn about the count, get involved. This is also the website that has that interactive map of all the overwintering sites in case you want to check out overwintering sites near you this season. Again, it's November 16th, so it's perfect time to go look at monarch butterflies clustering in your area. Um, and we have an FAQ page on that website too, in case you want some of our top recommendations on public sites to visit. But I'd really encourage you all um, selfishly because I help coordinate this, to get involved in this project next year. Um, maybe go out to some sites. Maybe you'll meet some of our volunteers or our coordinators out there doing their counts. They show up in the early mornings. Um, but yeah, so this project is a little more in depth than some of the others I'm going to talk to you about uh, because we're, again, comparing monarch counts across years. We do have that standardized protocol. So we do ask that volunteers receive a virtual training and an in-person training um, to get ready to participate in this project. That said, there's no fees whatsoever. It's completely free. Um, we do ask that you bring your own binoculars and we're starting to work on a program where we're supplying our coordinators with uh, a lendable pair of binoculars in case anyone needs that. So hopefully that initiative grows in the future so we can make this more accessible. But the supplies you would need to participate in the count include binoculars and then either a smartphone where you can access our digital data sheet forms um, or uh, access to a printer where you can print out our data sheets. And then what you'd do is you'd work with your regional coordinator. Again, these are experts based in kind of each county of California. You'd work with that person, meet up with other volunteers for the training, and then you would get assigned a site to go count a couple times during the Thanksgiving count and a couple times during that follow-up New Year's count. You'd send in your data to us, we'll summarize it, we'll share it out with you all and the rest of the world, and it'll go back to that kind of earlier, that graph we saw, that blue and green graph tracking the status of Western monarchs um, since 1997. We also have our volunteers look out for tagged monarch butterflies when they're searching for butterflies at the overwintering sites or in their own backyards. So here's a couple pictures of tagged butterflies. Um, they usually use a little tiny sticker <laughs> and paste it on the wings of monarchs um, during the breeding season. And then we see those monarchs migrate and each of these stickers has a unique ID code. And so when someone at an overwintering site sees a monarch, like see that upper right-hand picture of a monarch on a eucalyptus branch. So if we are using our binoculars, counting our monarchs, and we see one with a sticker, it's like this absolute party because it's so rare to find one. Um, but then we try to get a close-up picture of it. And then there's usually that unique ID number and uh, contact information, a phone number or an email address for the researcher responsible for that um, tagging project. And so then we contact them, send them the picture, and they're able to go back in their database, figure out where this individual monarch started, where it was tagged, and then we can see how far it's traveled. We can see how long it's been alive. Um, and it's just absolutely incredible to be able to tell that information. We've been able to discover that there is some interaction between Western monarchs and Eastern monarchs through tagging efforts. So we found some butterflies tagged in the East or tagged in the West on the opposite side or overwintering in Mexico versus California through these efforts. 
we've, we've also been able to better estimate the distances that monarchs are able to travel during the migration through these tagging efforts and also see how long they've lived. Um, and on this picture too, on the slide, you can see kind of this little makeshift tower that's blurred out in the background, as well as someone holding up a monarch butterfly with a little, you know, little device on its abdomen. So another thing that's coming out recently is the technology, super lightweight technology to be able to tag monarch butterflies um, and then pick up those sensors from little like radio towers. And so um, we're, we're just hopeful to see where technology leads us in the next few decades um, to be able to track these very lightweight species that are at risk so that we can better protect the habitats that they're relying on again. Um, so exciting stuff in the works. It's a really cool time to get involved. At this time, you do need a permit in California to handle or tag monarch butterflies. So if you do not have, if you're not on a permit to do so, um, it's highly discouraged and, and, and against the law to actually handle monarch butterflies in our state. It's not true for all states in the United States, um, but it is for California. So do be aware of that. And if you're interested in getting involved in a tagging project, um, you can contact different universities. Um, that are engaging in that sort of research and try to get on one of those permits. Now, the um, this is kind of leading back to both the Western Monarch Count Project and the tagging that I just mentioned, but this is one of the implications of all the work that our community scientists are doing. Um, so this is one of the reasons that all that work is so important. Right now, in preparation for the potential listing of monarch butterflies next fall, Xerxes is re, um, what's the word? We are redoing or um, re, oh my gosh. We're basically honing in on all of the monarch butterfly sites and pulling all the data and point GPS points that people have submitted to us for clustering monarch locations and redefining these these specific overwintering site boundaries so that we can best protect that critical habitat in the future. Um, and so one of my colleagues, Ashley Fisher, is doing really wonderful work working with our regional coordinators, our community scientists, and uh, monarch specialists across California and beyond to redefine and update these boundaries. And so this is going to have an impact on the habitats that are you know, protected under law um, for monarchs. So you as an everyday person could be contributing data for a site near you and your community that would then help that grove be protected. So you're very much having a direct impact on the conservation of monarch butterflies um, in your area and collectively <laughs> across the West. So um, we're really excited about this work that Ashley's doing. Uh, again, informed by the, the efforts of all of our community scientists. Um, another thing that our volunteers are doing during the counts is collecting dead butterflies. So once the monarchs are already dead, um, they can be collected. Again, you do have to be on a permit, but you could join <laughs> if you wanted to. You could get on this permit. Um, I put a link here, participate in California. So you can get on this permit from the Colorado State University to collect dead butterflies and send them in to um, some of these research labs. And they're going to do studies on the genomics um, and try to tell some of the, um, <clears throat> to better understand resident and migratory monarch populations, to try to better understand like the life history um, of these monarchs and kind of their interactions with the environments around them. So you can tell so much from the genome and um, that's currently underway too at, yeah, again, Colorado State University. And then there's some folks at UC Davis who are taking those samples as well and doing another, um, I think, isotope study um, using like monarch wings. So if you do see dead monarchs around, maybe make a note, you could let Xerxes Society know um, or if you feel interested in getting involved in this project yourself, again, go to the link on this website um, and you can sign up. You just have to take a quick little uh, kind of quiz um, 
and then you can be added to the permit to collect dead butterflies to send them in to help us better understand these sorts of relationships with monarchs. Now, another project that you could participate in beyond the Western Monarch Count, which again is happening right now, is the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper Project. This one requires a little less training. Um, so you actually don't need to be trained at all in person. We do have a website though that would be helpful for you to review just so that you're able to identify monarch butterflies since they do have a few lookalikes and also milkweed plants. So the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper Project is a year round community science effort um, really low investment. What you need is a smartphone or a camera and access to a computer um, because you're going to be uploading your observations either through your smartphone or on your computer to iNaturalist or the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper website. And what we're looking for is monarch and milkweed sightings across the Western United States. So monarchs of all life stages, whether that's eggs, caterpillars, chrysalis, or adult butterflies, and also any species of milkweed plant um, of any stage. So maybe in early spring, you want to tell us that your milkweed's emerging in your backyard. That's great. We want that picture of that early emerging milkweed sprout to help us better understand when monarch, or sorry, when milkweed is emerging in spring. Um, that helps us understand, you know, changing phenology with climate change and um, when and where milkweed's popping up across the West. Uh, so, so that's really helpful and important. And then also just knowing where monarchs are, where we're seeing hotspots for breeding, um, or vice versa, where we're seeing just like empty areas. Um, those things can tell us a lot. And then we'll try to get more and more people engaged in submitting photos to us so that we can better understand and track these um, observances. And so all this data is available for researchers, uh, for conservationists, to the public too. So community science, um, you know, you all are giving to us, you're giving us your observations, and then we summarize the data and provide that to you all so that it can be used in various ways to support other conservation projects. So for both the Western Monarch Count and the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper, we provide our data that's collected through the projects um, through the website. So you can just go and access that and check it out um, right now if you'd like. So again, Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper is going to be great for all of you to start doing um, in spring, summer, fall. And um, you just take a picture, submit your data, and learn about monarchs and their host plants. Um, so it could be in wild spaces and parks while you're going on a hike, it could be in your backyard, it could be out front of your school, it could be out front of your workplace. It really doesn't matter where you're seeing monarchs or milkweed. We just want you to take a picture and submit it. Um, so again, if you're using iNaturalist, which I highly encourage all of you to download the iNaturalist app on your smartphones, it looks like that little green bird pictured on the right-hand corner in that teal box. Um, download iNaturalist on your smartphones if you haven't already. Create an account. It's totally free. And then what you can do is just snap pictures of monarchs, milkweed, and also any other cool thing like the cool mushroom you found, um, some plant in your backyard that you don't know what the name of it is. And then you can post it on iNaturalist and the people will identify it for you if you don't know what it is or you can suggest an identification and people around you will go in and confirm that it'll become a verified sighting and then it'll be used in our research projects at Xerces and in a bunch of other research projects across the world. So again, download iNaturalist. If you do one thing after watching this webinar, download iNaturalist. <laughs> um, okay, another one is the Western Monarch Mystery Challenge. This happens February through April each year. So we're really trying to capture the migration of these the super generation monarchs from the overwintering sites to their breeding habitat. And this is kind of this like critical period after that super generation has traveled down the sites, survived the winter, and now they're gonna kick off the new breeding generation. Um, and so we're trying to capture where and when monarch or when and where monarchs are in the Western United States through this mystery challenge each February and April. 
So again, if you're interested in participating in that one, all you have to do is take a picture when you see a monarch butterfly and report it through iNaturalist, the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper Project, or email it to monarch mystery challenge, or sorry, monarch mystery at wsu.edu. Um, and also this one's really fun because they give out prizes each week to participants. So um, hopefully that continues next year, but last year they were giving out like REI gift cards once a week to um, a random draw of whoever submitted observations throughout that last week. Um, there's also the International Monarch Monitoring Blitz that's uh, coordinated by the CEC, but um, Xerces participates in this through our Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper project as well. It happens for a two week period, July through August. So we're getting into that kind of summer breeding zone. Um, again, same, same kind of deal here, really low investment. All you have to do is take pictures of monarchs, any life stage and of milkweed plants in and around your community and then submit it again through iNaturalist, the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper Project, or there's like a number of other monarch community science programs that participate like Journey North, um, Monarch Joint Ventures MLMP program. So if you wanna learn more about the International Monarch Monitoring Blitz, you can go to www.cec.org slash International Monarch Monitoring Blitz and learn about that. I think this project is really amazing because it brings together people from Canada, the United States, and Mexico in this like tri-national effort. So that one feels a little bigger and broader than just the Western United States. Um, so if you're interested in doing that, look out for Monarch Blitz um, info in June and July. We'll be posting about it at Xerces, so you could also just follow along with us on social media and we'll send you reminders about that. Other ways to help include protecting and managing the overwintering sites, so advocating in your communities to protect those groves, starts with you going to visit them and falling in love like I did, and then um, wanting to do what you can in your free time to help protect them. Um, restoring breeding and migratory habitats, so again, planting those milkweed and nectar resources. Protecting monarchs and their habitat from pesticides, so again, trying to find those pollinator-friendly or bee-friendly plants at your nurseries asking questions, making sure that you're getting plants that won't cause um, unintended harm to the pollinators you're encouraging to visit your garden. You also want to protect, manage, and restore breeding um, and fall migration monarch habitat outside of California. So if you have friends and family outside of the West, you can encourage them to do the same to benefit monarchs and other at-risk pollinators. And then answer key research questions about how to best aid Western monarch recovery. And you can do that through participating in community science. Um, so those are a few ways to help. Uh, I'm going to wrap up soon so that we can do some questions. But um, here's a picture of one type of milkweed used in restoration. Uh, I also want to plug Xerces Habitat Kits one more time. So Xerces has another program that's really, really wonderful. We have monarch and pollinator habitat kits that are free of charge. You just have to apply. Um, it is a really popular program. So I will say that not everyone gets accepted to receive a habitat kit, but if you are a land manager involved in an organization focused on restoration or community engagement or community education, I really encourage you to apply for that Xerces habitat kits. Um, and so go to our website, Xerces.org and look up the habitat kit program because you can receive a truckload of free, um, bee-friendly, pollinator-friendly, native monarch host plants and nectar plants to put on the land. Um, and it's we source from um, different nurseries based on each region. So if you're in Southern California, we'll source Southern California plants. If you're in Northern California, we'll, we'll source Northern California plants for you. So we kind of take care of that for you. And all you have to do is, um, again, apply and then show up to to pick up those plants and take them back um, to your area. So check that out. And then also here's a couple other opportunities for those of you who are maybe individual community members interested in getting involved in community science. You can check out xerces.org. Our community science page has opportunities for bumblebee community science, butterfly community science, firefly community science, so check out our programs as well as SciStarter, 
Um, SciStarter is a really cool website where you can search for different community science projects based on your location, interests, areas, or interest species, and much more like, um, you know, different time commitments uh, and accessibility needs. So I really recommend SciStarter. Um, you can check out our project-specific sites for monarchs, such as, again, the Western Monarch Count website and the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper website. Um, really encourage you to do that. Here's a little blurb on our California bumblebee atlas, just in case any of you might be interested in surveying for bumblebees too. Uh, I like to promote this with our monarch projects because our seasons kind of alternate. So when it's monarch monitoring busy season, it's kind of bumblebee off season. And then when you wrap up with monarchs, now you can get involved in bumblebees. So um, if that's appealing to you at all, you can learn about all the cool native bumblebees in your area um, and help us track those populations and um, occurrence data as well. So with that, I just wanna say thank you to all of our supporters, funders, community scientists, volunteers, partners. Um, we are a donor supported nonprofit. So we just really rely on the engagement and support of all of you. Um, and so we're just very, very grateful. Uh, I'm going to end my slideshow now, sharing. Thank you, Isis. You're getting some, some love in the chat. Someone said they could listen to you talk about monarchs all day. Yay, <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> I love that overview. I just really appreciate it. I think there's just so many different things people can get involved in. And I, I feel like that was, that was really well done. Thank you for all the information. If yeah. you have questions, please put them in the Q&A icon. Um, that's the best way for us to be able to organize them so we don't lose track. And um, yeah, so we'll start off. There's some great questions in here. First of all, how was the data around 1990 to 2015 estimated from historical records and used in these types of calculations slash graphs to compare with actual counts done in recent years by community members? Hmm, okay. I'm just pulling up this question because it's a long one. Um, okay, yeah. So I think this might be referring to that graph done by our partners with um, Cheryl Schultz with WSU. Um, <clears throat> so just to start with, again, from 1997 to present, we do have the community science data that we're working with that's actively submitted by our community science volunteers and partners that we then summarize and publish each year. But we've um, partnered with researchers who use special, special fancy modeling um, tools to kind of go back in time and estimate those um, pre-90s, 80s, and before records. We also have um, really amazing reports from different individuals, such as Walt Sakai, um, that track, like that summarize their findings of monarchs in the 80s and prior. So we have these records and reports that we're using in tandem with our 97 data onwards to use, um, to plug into these models and estimate those populations before we were actively tracking at overwintering sites. I hope that kind of answers that question. Um, yeah, and yeah. you asked if counting methods have remained the same just because you mentioned the GPS technology or tagging um, butterflies. Yeah, so this is a great one. So counting methods, yeah, have remained the same since 1997 and onwards. I mean, we've kind of, we've amped up the protocol a little bit just to make it um, a little more formal. We formalized it, but ultimately with Western monarchs, we are, again, we're not seeing incredibly high numbers, unfortunately. But also fortunately for us community scientists, because then we get to go out and actually count them <laughs> in person. Um, some of you may have been lucky enough to go witness the Eastern monarchs clustering down in Mexico. And there are way more monarchs clustering in Mexico than there are on the West Coast. So they cannot possibly count those butterflies with binoculars. Instead, those um, Eastern monarchs are estimated using like aerial photography and they determine how many hectares of land are populated by overwintering monarchs. And then they estimate that pop that Eastern population from the number of hectares occupied. 
at the overwintering groves. So um, the methods for counting differ between Eastern and Western monarchs, but for Western monarchs, we've really been, yeah, basically having community scientists volunteers go out, look at clusters and, and estimate that on the ground for us. Um, yeah, and yeah, the tagging again, we'll just see how that evolves. Obviously stickers are great, but it's it requires people on the ground to be able to like find those butterflies with the stickers and then be able to see that unique ID code and the email. And again, we're talking about a little tiny sticker put on a little tiny monarch up in a tree really high. So it's pretty difficult. Um, so I think that with the advancement of technology, being able to attach little sensors that are maybe solar um, powered or, sun or something, I think that's going to be really helpful for uh, future conservation efforts. In that same vein, Karen, welcome, Karen. She's one of our new ambassadors, is wondering if the tags affect the flight of the monarch, if there's been any studies on that. Yeah, so part of what the researchers are doing is they'll do pilot projects with a small small group of monarchs just to see um, how it might impact them. And um, as far as I'm aware, it hasn't, the, the new technology has been approved for a larger um, studies. So we're not seeing detriment, like super detrimental impacts to monarchs flights. It's the sensors usually attached to the monarchs abdomen. And so it's not getting in the way of it moving its wings. Um, and yeah, so we'll see. These are kind of the con, you know, they're a little bit nuanced, right? Because we want to save, we want to help support monarch butterflies. But in order to do that, we need information. And um, yeah, interfering with with animals is is always a little bit of a tricky topic, right? Um, I personally struggle with it as a conservation biologist, and I think that the fact that you're asking this question is really important. It means you care and you want the best for the monarchs, and I think we need more people asking those questions, right? Because then we're going to get to that solution that meets the monarchs' needs and the research needs to hopefully create a future where we still have monarchs and not a future where in a couple of decades, we don't see them anymore. So I kind of went on a little rant there, but yeah, great question. It's not a perfect answer, but yeah, we haven't noticed detrimental impacts with those tags yet. And if we did, we would do some, you know, people would do something else. I'm saying we, but Cersei isn't doing this, but, but, you know, researchers wouldn't do something that they knew actively like harmed butterflies. So not for this. <laughs> Definitely. So Mike is wondering, I love this question, why do monarch butterflies feed on milkweed specifically, the caterpillars? I guess maybe you could clarify that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> well, so milkweed is, um, you know, so there's co-evolution, right? Like <laughs> animals and plants develop um, different relationships over time. Sometimes that's because of, you know, competing for different resources. So if every insect was using a certain type of plant, then there would be less resources <laughs> for them all. So they kind of develop these specialized niches to kind of spread the resource. <laughs> I don't know, I'm saying this as if they're doing it intentionally, but it's kind of like natural selection too and co-evolution again. Um, but we're, but yeah, basically milkweed has certain chemical properties that when ingested by the monarch caterpillar, allow them certain protections from predation. So um, milkweeds are actually toxic to a number of animals. And when monarch caterpillars ingest them, they ingest those chemicals that are toxic to animals. And then um, we have some pictures of birds like taking bites out of monarchs and then like yakking it back up or it like tastes really bitter or yucky. So um, a lot of predators will like taste taste <laughs> their prey. So they'll like take a little chunk out and then be like, is this for me? Is it not for me? Um, same thing when you think about like, you know, animals who are eating your garden, plants. they'll usually like take a little nibble. And then if it tastes terrible, they'll like move on to something else. Um, so again, all these plants and animals are kind of coming up with these different protection measures to not only, you know, make sure they have abundant resources, but also to make sure that they're protected from predators. And so that's kind of the reasoning behind monarchs and milkweed there. And can you clarify, so adult monarchs need more than just milkweed, right? 
Yeah, so adult monarchs lay their eggs on milkweed and the caterpillars only need milkweed, but adult monarch butterflies will nectar on a variety of different plants in your garden. So you'll see them on a ton of different flowers that have nectar. And so that's why planting nectar resources that span different colors, different seasons from like early spring to midsummer to late fall, that's really important too when you're planting for monarch butterflies. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I know Isis didn't mention this. She mentioned bug banter, but she actually, our last episode was with Isis talking about Western monarchs and community science. And we have another one coming up next month with Ray Morans, who is also on our staff doing monarchs east of the Rockies. And this was something we talked about that people often think about milkweed and milkweed only, but we also need nectar plants for the adults, which is just as important and sometimes really deficient in really important areas um, that they don't have enough plants to feed off of. So um, yeah, it's, it's more than just, just milkweed. So we are almost at time, but we're going to go a little bit over. We have a few more really good questions. So I'm taking this out of the chat, but just as a reminder, please put questions in the Q and a icon. Thank you, Carly, for that reminder. Um, Jennifer was lucky enough to be a recipient of one of our Xerces native hedgerow plants, as well as 300 milkweed, um, plugs for the local, um, conservation district. And Yay. they um, yeah, it's super exciting. So they planted in, in their Napa County burned property. They're wondering what kind of trees would be good um, to encourage monarchs to overwintering, or will they do that that far inland? They're about 60 miles from the coast. Okay. Um, wait, you say that one's in the chat, Rachel? Yeah. So they're 60 miles inland from the coast. In oh, Napa. okay. And they're just wondering if there are specific trees that they could plant for overwintering monarchs, or is that sort of not even applicable because they're not going to overwinter in that area? Yeah. So thanks for asking this question. Um, overwintering monarchs typically, uh, we typically find them within five miles of the coast, and most of them are within, honestly, like one to three miles of the coast. So we have very few uh, inland overwintering sites, those being in the Saline Valley of California. Monarchs tend to, we see a number of monarchs overwintering on different um, kind of bushes in the Saline Valley. And then we also have a number of monarchs that overwinter in Arizona. But we're talking like, you know, dozens to a couple hundred versus the uh, like hundreds of thousands that are overwintering on the California coast. So if you're 60 miles inland, I would say don't focus too much on trees, but really do continue to plant those native nectar and milkweed resources and, and spread the word for your neighbors and other community members to do the same. Perfect. It looks like Jacqueline asked for the link to apply for a permit to collect data, which I've also put in the chat for everyone else, but they were also asking if the uh, permit costs money. Yeah, good question. So the one, the permit that you can get on to collect dead monarchs is totally free. Again, I think it should just take you like 30 minutes to read about the project and then take that 10 to 15 minute quiz. And by, it's not asking you to like have certain knowledge. It's just making sure you read the protocol and the instructions um, kind of expectations for participating in that research. So yeah, check out that. Um, again, if you have an extra 30, 40 minutes, like might as well get on that permit so that if November, December, January, you see some dead monarchs around the coast, around these overwintering sites, you can send those in. And actually, um, so before when you sent them in, we had to like kind of pay for to, to mail them off. But now um, that research lab is actually providing shipping labels and can provide you with uh, materials to mail the monarch in too. So if you get on that permit, you'll be added to a mailing list to get all that information, all those resources. So hopefully the only things you're investing are your time and any transportation costs like gas that you're using to get to certain sites. Perfect, thank you. All right, are there, this is a good question. Are there Xerces Habitat kits only for California applicants or would this be across a different range? This um, Ingrid is in Oregon and can think of potential projects that would be beneficial from this. Ooh, you know what, Xerces Habitat. Let's see here. So um, yeah, there are Habitat kit. Yeah, there's Oregon Pollinator kits. So I'm going to pop this website link in the chat right now. Um, credit to everyone. Okay, 
I just popped the pollinator conservation habitat kits link from Xerces Society into the chat. So check that out. Um, this is our main page. So if you are in California and want to check out California habitat kits, you can click that first link. But then we've got some for Detroit, Northeast, Oregon, Santa Fe, Wisconsin. So maybe we're not everywhere yet, but we do have a number of regions that are included in that program. Thank you, Isis, for putting there so quick. I feel like you're stealing our job. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. Are there any non-invasive methods to count clusters of monarchs like sonar or thermal imaging and how successful are they? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. So that's a great question. And, um, you know, I think too that uh, someone, Natalie Johnson with um, the, the Pacific Grove um, Museum of Natural History, who's our coordinator for Monterey for the Thanksgiving house, she mentioned to me last week when I was visiting her at the Grove, she mentioned something about like infrared um, technology and, and seeing if we could pick up um, on monarchs and groves with that. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for, for researchers to kind of figure out various ways to track monarchs. Um, and I think honestly, more ways, the better, right? I and mean, we can just cross-reference what we find from each of these tactics. And I know that um, in Mexico, <coughs> excuse me, in Mexico, they've created some, they've sent some drones out um, to kind of take footage. And I am not sure what the implications were of that, because again, this is like a big flying creature, question, quote unquote, like going around between these overwintering monarchs. So there's, you know, there's always going to be some sort of impact usually. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I There's certainly research going on right now looking into different ways to, to kind of estimate populations. Um, but we're also still navigating the cost <laughs> of new technology and how to implement it across like wide landscape, wide ranges. Yeah. All right, you have a couple of personal questions that I'll end on, but one more before that. Uh, I love the personal questions. I'm going into podcast mode now. <laughs> um, are there any criteria for maintaining the milkweed when it goes dormant? Should we prune it back or just let it die back? Great question. We get this one a lot. So um, when milkweed goes dormant, um, you can, I mean, <clears throat> part of this is, is what you need to do, right? Uh, we encourage you to leave the leaves or leave the stems in your garden, um, because sometimes they benefit other pollinators or inverts, um, or they just add to the soil <laughs> and help create that organic layer on top. Um, but I would say when it is important to trim your milkweed back is when, it gets to like late November, December, and your milkweed is still up. Usually we see this with non-native or tropical milkweed, but in some areas like the Bay Area or Southern California, we might also see this with native milkweeds just because of our changing climates. They're not getting cold enough anymore to, to like trigger or cue that, that dying back of our native plants. So if it's November, December, we really do... Um, and if you're next to or near an overwintering site, we do recommend cutting those milkweed back. Um, as long as there's, you know, no monarchs breeding on it, it, if there's caterpillars and eggs and stuff, you may not, again, you can't handle them. You can't like interfere in California. So just be aware of that. But yeah, if it's late in the season, they haven't died back yet, you don't have monarchs on your plants, I would recommend maybe cutting those to the, to the ground, to the ground, but you could like leave the organic matter there. Perfect. All right. Two last questions. First of all, where did you get your earrings? We were in ah. before we started. Yeah. Thank you for noticing. Um, these were gifted to me by a lovely individual up in Sonoma County. I was working for the Yakyama um, intertribal organization, helping them um, develop plans for monarch and pollinator conservation. And I was gifted these at a sunrise ceremony. Oh, that's really sweet. Yeah. Uh, Alina, last question. I love this question. Uh, what sort of career education backgrounds? Oh, do we all have? Oh, Carly, we're getting a question. <laughs> no so team. 
team is looking into getting into conservation work full time, do you have any recommendations that don't involve additional agree degrees? And I actually think that's great to ask as a group because we're sort of mixed in that realm. So I'll start with Isis. Do you want to answer that first and then Carly? Yeah, I love this question. So if you're looking to get into conservation work full time and you don't want to involve additional degrees, um, get involved in community science, like start collecting that data, build those relationships and mentorship offered, you know, like there's so there's a mix of people in these community science projects. So we've got professionals, we've got agency partners from, you know, national parks, state parks, regional parks, we've got local conservation organizations, we've got fish and wildlife, we've got you know, just CDFW, like you can meet so many incredible people who will help you break into that field when you're ready to, and you're going to be getting this hands-on experience, not only interacting with the species in person, but also collecting that data, better understanding the conservation needs, threats, and get that background knowledge, kind of the information between like plant, animal ecosystems. Um, I'd really recommend... <laughs> It, your question's perfect for this webinar because yeah, community science is probably a great way to get started um, if you wanna engage. And then in terms of background, so I have my bachelor's degree in environmental science and protection, um, management and protection from Cal Poly. And I have a minor in biology. And um, I also have, uh, I took training with Outward Bound on outdoor education. Um, and I also have, experience, professional experience working in like sustainable agriculture with the resource conservation districts in California. So um, that's kind of my background, plant, animal, people. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing. Carly, did you want to share a little bit about your background, how you ended up here? Yeah, I was going to say the exact same thing as ISIS, definitely citizen science and volunteering is the way to go. Um, I used to work at a national wildlife refuge doing um, wildlife surveys and a lot of my volunteers used me as a reference um, on their future job applications. Um, so any, like Isa said, any organization that you can get in with is a great step forward. I have a bachelor's of science degree in environmental science and management from Portland State University and minors in biology and sustainability. I started out as a volunteer in the conservation field um, for a couple of years at the refuge and then they actually hired me on as a seasonal position and then more permanent positions. So it's a great, yeah, it's a great way to get your foot in the door to network and to work your way up. Awesome. Thanks, Carly. My background's a little bit different. I sort of went in and out of I started at getting my undergraduate in ecology at um, Seattle Pacific University. And I worked at the aquarium and worked with kids doing interp. And then I actually worked on cruise ships as, an, as a naturalist to Hawaii and Alaska. I worked for the forest service as a bear guide and an interp ranger for the park service in Alaska. So I really loved working with people, but then I went back and got my master's in wildlife conservation in Maine and thought I wanted to do research. So I researched wolves and caribou dynamics up in Edmonton, Canada. And um, actually it was technically in uh, British Columbia, but I missed people. So I came back, worked at a wildlife refuge, the same one with Carly, actually. Um, she was one of my volunteers and now she works here. So volunteering really does get your foot in the door. Um, so having a master's certainly helped me get to this point and I went very roundabout I've done research but my background is in wildlife biology not in entomology and somehow I ended up at Xerces but I've the best advice I ever got is it's not about the animals you work with it's about the tools that you want in your toolbox to be able to work with that that wildlife and so if you're doing conservation I think volunteering figuring out what you're interested in I kind of fell into volunteer management I absolutely love it but now I'm doing webinars and a podcast so you never know where life will take you but I think the advice Isis and Carly gave was really wonderful and um, you don't have to have a master's. I just wanted to get mine and that um, certainly helps. And I would say a lot of people we do hire has not have master's degrees, but not always. Um, and if you ever have questions or wanna reach out to anyone on staff, I hope the listeners know you can always reach out to us and ask us um, about how to get your foot in the door and if there are opportunities. And we're definitely gonna be hiring quite a few positions in the next year. So check out our job opportunity page. Um, we'd love to have you all on board. Well, thank you, Isis, for being here. And thank you for that question. It was nice to answer a question. <laughs> yeah, um, I loved it. 
Yeah, thank you for your presentation. It was really wonderful. I learned a lot. I hope folks did here too. Thank you, Carly, for being here and for helping co-host. We hope to all see you back on our next webinar. Next month will be with Ray Moran's talking about monarchs east of the Rockies. So we're kind of covering monarchs across the U.S., which is which is really nice, and Canada and Mexico. So. <laughs> well, thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day.